So the nature of science always in the history has been that it is incremental, right? There are like very few works that come in like out of blue that are making a very like pivotal change completely, like changing the whole directions of the science. More, more often than not, it is a very incremental steps, right? And that increment nature uh, calls for a uh, high quantity of work, right? Because every work is adding like a tiny baby step to the science. So hello and welcome everyone to who's ever tuning into this particular podcast. Uh, I have with me uh, Dr. Ga- Meena Gashmi on the podcast today. Uh, Meena is an applied scientist in the uh, Alexa video team at Amazon Science alongside being a lecturer at Stanford University. Prior to joining Amazon, she was a research scientist at Visa Research working on recommendation systems built on transactions from users and few other projects. She completed her doctorate in computer science from University of Utah, followed by a postdoctoral position at Rutgers University. At Amazon, she's mainly focused on video-based recommendation systems, something we will talk in detail about in this conversation. Uh, so Meena, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for being here and excited to have you. Yes, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> so uh, can you tell us a little bit about the projects that you're currently involved uh, at Amazon Science and what are the broad areas of research that you are targeting with those projects? Right. Um, so um, I joined Amazon about like two years ago and since then I've been in part of the Alexa Video Org. And um, so in Alexa Video Org, I have worked on um, majorly like two set of problems, the ranking problems for video entities and the recommendations for video entities. Um, on the uh, ranking problem, um, our um, focus is on surfacing the right video entities to customers when they use particularly their voice to request a video from Alexa. So for example, when the customer says, Alexa, play a Stranger Things, based on the uh, contextual information that we have from the customers and based on the recency of the movies, we would like to surface the right Stranger Things to customers. So that is the ranking problem. And the recommendation problem is actually um, ideally when the device, there are multiple use cases for recommendations on Alexa devices, both multimodal devices like Echo Show and the Fire TV devices. But in either of the cases, we want to actually show a set of personalized recommendations uh, to customers based on their past interactions on videos with Alexa. So these are about like the two main domains that I've been involved in. I see. And do these, like, uh, correct me if my understanding, because I have a lack of understanding for recommendation systems, but do these work on tags based? So, like, you have tags from certain uh, videos, like, okay, what uh, what do these uh, videos relate to and the content relate to? And then you match based on customers' information that is being analyzed uh, throughout the time. And then you basically map these two particular tags, as in what would be the best uh, serve to a customer. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is uh, basically on a high level, like how recommendation algorithms work. But then we have a bunch of like features uh, or metadata for our video entities, for any like type of entities, like whether it is like videos or music, books or product items, anything. We have to have a bunch of videos so that we can um, kind of um, infer a similarity between a video and a customer, right? Based on their past interactions with the devices. Um, so for videos, as you mentioned, like we have a lot of such information or features like the release date of them or the popularity of them, number of votes or the ratings that they have received on uh, various like websites like IMDB and so on and so forth. Also, we have a lot of information on the plot um, or the you know summary of the TV show or the videos. So we will use a collection of all of these informations and then we, they, they will go like through like uh, heavy like feature transformation so that they are suitable for the algorithms. So this is just one piece of information that we will use in our recommendation algorithms. The other main stream and source of information comes from the customers. Um, and that part is responsible for uh, um, the customer profiling and capturing customers' taste, their preferences, their behavior with devices, right? And those usually like um, include uh, customers' uh, past search queries, customers' past um, watches, like how many minutes they spend on every video, um, what genres they prefer the most based on their uh, previous watches and all, and, and so on and so forth. And then we kind of marry these two together and then we add contextual information too, like from the context. What day of the week do they usually watch? What time of the day do they usually watch? What devices do they use? And 
which countries or uh, marketplaces the customer is located in. Um, so all of these informations together uh, should help us to infer the right uh, video entity to recommend to customers. Right. And and how do you do these feature engineering processes? Like, is there like a domain expertise that you guys would be referring to as in which metadata features that I should be including into a recommendation system? Like you said, like location and all those things, like some features could be as you like, they could be useless in recommendation systems. So is there like a, a technical process that you do? Like, I think like feature optimization that works best for a recommendation, or do you do like a manual analysis that, okay, do we want these particular features to be included in our recommendation systems? So how do you manage those feature engineering techniques? Okay, so um, so for for deciding what features we have to include in an algorithm, right? Usually we have to look at the, how informative a feature is, right? Mm -hmm. um, we will start with a set of intuitive features and through a, a process that is called ablation study, we can remove the pro we can remove these like super set of features into like a smaller set. We can shrink this set and then see if the performance of our model is actually degrading mm -hmm. on a validation set or not. Right? Ideally, you don't want to uh, your first model to use a lot of features. You want to start like very lean and a small. Um, and see what performance you are getting in an A-B testing when you are putting it into an online experiment. And then you will experiment with that as a baseline by adding like more features and see how it's gonna work. So that's about like how you start with a set of features. Um, so I would say that we always start with a set of intuitive features that we know that they are uh, impacting customers' uh, behaviors, like genre of a video, right? Or the rating of a video, the recency of a video, and stuff like that. Um, that's number one. And then number two is that certain type of features require a heavier feature engineering and feature transformations. Um, for example, converting the text or the plot of a movie, converting the cast or the directors um, uh, or the people involved in the, in the movie into a feature, converting these into a feature takes more uh, like takes more work. You have to actually use like mm, proper text embedding methods uh, most of the time, these uh, off-the-shelf embedding method like more to wake or glob, right? They uh, underperform. They do not capture the semantic similarity of the movie entities that well. So you have to take uh, some pre-trained embedding models and then fine-tune it on your own domain, which is here, the videos, to uh, gain a proper embedding for text. So for the first phase of the recommendation models, usually we set aside these features. We don't touch them. And we just want to see that what we can get with a baseline model. Um, mm. that, that's about it. And then depending on what algorithms you're using for recommendations, you would need to apply certain transformations on the features to normalize them, uh, to standardize them. Um, some, uh, most of the algorithms don't take any string at all, right, as a, as a format. Mm. So it has to be like float values. Um, so stuff like that. All right. And, and, and I just have one last technical question before we uh, deep dive into uh, your background is uh, you, you mentioned something about the validation set. Like in this case, I think one of the most intriguing thing about my recommendations research is to figure out these target labels, right? Like for, I think for other tasks, it's very easy. Like you have classification targets or segmentation masks and everything, which is like fairly simple to understand, but how do you get these targets for recommendation systems? Because let's say for you are working at Amazon, like it's very hard to generalize, okay, uh, is this recommendation system good or not? And that is heavily based on the targets of these uh, things that you assign, right? Like is, the, is this like a metric going up or going down? Uh, how much uh, effort does it go to like label these targets for recommendation uh, systems training? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, because the quality of the ground truth that we have or the quality of labels that we have uh, govern or dictate the quality of the recommendation system that we get, right? As uh, mm -hmm. we were talking earlier, garbage in, garbage out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, how we do it uh, in Alexa video is that um, we use a customer's past interactions on, in an aggregated level to infer ground truth for customers. And what we have observed is that the notion of ground truth for video entities change from marketplace to marketplace, right? So what, uh, mm, for example, we have two versions of the office show. One is in UK and one is US, right? And based on the marketplace of the customers, they may prefer one to the other. So mm -hmm. um, 
So what we do is that we actually look at the, like uh, we can actually look at it like globally or per marketplace. We will look at the interactions of the customers on the Alexa devices and see that, for example, when they go to the Fire TV devices and they search for a video title, and then we list down a bunch of relevant video titles to them, how often they click on a surface video entity, right? Um, usually the highest click entity is the one that is the most relevant to that search query. And so as a result, this one should be the ground truth entity. So this is how we infer. And as you mentioned, um, like um, unlike like academia or like for example, the um, very clean data sets that we have on like um, Kaggles or like toy examples, right? When it comes to industry, the data is really messy and unclean and a lot of effort needs to go into it to infer the ground truth and clean the data. Um, I can actually give another example on this, that um, in a previous work, um, in my previous job at Visa Research, uh, we had uh, we were working on a project that was uh, called the restaurant recommendations for a group of cardholders, right? And to build that, irrespective of the algorithm that we were gonna use, we needed to know that for a group of cardholders, what is their kind of favorite uh, restaurant or what is their top 10 favorite restaurants? So we needed to have some notion of a labeling. And of course, we didn't have that. And collecting that data like from customers in the street or in the restaurants is just absolutely um, not possible. So what we did was that actually like we had to develop a method that goes into our past historical like transactions and then just check that, for example, which set of customers have checked out from the same rest from one restaurant like frequently within like maybe three minutes of each other. And then we would infer that, okay, if this set of customers have checked out within a small time neighborhood of each other, then probably they are a group of friends dining together. And if that restaurant happens a lot, or if that cuisine happens a lot, then you would infer that, okay, so that restaurant or that cuisine is of their favorite. And that's how we would kind of infer the ground truth label for the restaurants. So all of this creativity needs to be, you know, at new needs to be at work to for us to uh, kind of uh, decide decide on the labels and ground rule. Yeah, I mean, I I have a lot uh, already many follow-ups on these uh, particular things that you mentioned, like the technical aspects and also the uh, working aspects. But I I want I, I want to take a step back and come to these points later on. And first of all, I want to know know more about the uh, role that you have. So you're working as an applied scientist at Amazon. So what does the routine look like for you as in like what are the deliverables of a person who is a researcher and also works as an applied scientist look like we already know how how does the routine for a software developer uh, engineer look like but what does it look like like what kind of deliverables you work on and what is the thing that you take on and deliver in terms of uh, projects mm -hmm. um so um First, that different companies have different naming for their roles, right? Uh, here in Amazon, my title is Applied Scientist. At Visa Research, my title was a Research Scientist. But the kind of job description was very similar, right? In Amazon, we have another title that's called Research Scientist. So we have Research Scientist and Applied Scientist. And they only differ like uh, very partially. They differ only in um, their responsibility in pushing a feature or, or a product into productionizing. Um, so so that's, that's one thing to note that these titles are kind of very company dependent, right? So, yeah. But then talking about what applied scientists do in Amazon is that, um, so we are responsible for a wide range of tasks. Um, first of all, we have to be updated with the research, like for the domain that we are working in, right? Um, uh, we tend to keep ourselves like very up-to-date. We have like a lot of mechanisms in place that we would read research papers. We have brainstorming sessions uh, with the colleagues and teammates. And we have like presentations within the team and then in a wider range of audience to the org to present um, uh, like new techniques or just like discuss the paper ideas that we can actually employ in our own work, right? So that is uh, something that we have always had. Um, and then, uh, when it comes to the more uh, like specific responsibilities that we have is that for a given problem, like we are responsible in kind of uh, writing a roadmap 
to begin with. We should be able to envision a roadmap that, uh, hey, if I'm working on a recommendation algorithm, and this is the first attempt, for example, that we are making on recommendations in the Alexa video org, then we should have a roadmap that in phase one, we want to have this, which is something based as a baseline. And in phase two, we want to expand on it, and in phase three, and so on and so forth. And we should um, kind of uh, know that what is gonna be the status of the like, recommender, a video, Alexa video recommender in the next year or in the next like two years. So that's about the roadmap. And the roadmap uh, comes with a lot of discussions with our engineers and our uh, product managers, because it has to consider all the product requirements that we have and the priorities of them. And we are gonna like uh, propose a bunch of algorithmic methods that we can use the pros and cons of each methods and uh, how uh, engineering heavy or how resource heavy those are. So all these considerations come in place and the team come together. And then we decide basically um, um, which algorithms we would use, which methods, which modeling approach we would use for the first phase or the second phase and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that is uh, kind of one of the biggest responsi responsibilities that we have because that means that we are on the driver's seat and we are navigating exactly the science evolution of, for example, the domain that we are working in, right? And uh, so this is kind of the long, long term because we are looking at the next like few quarters or the next one year, right? And we plan it for the team. And uh, so once we do that, like in a more midterm, uh, we will uh, kind of talk about, okay, now what is gonna be our delivery for the next quarter? Is it just gonna be a prototype of the modeling approach that is uh, approved by the team? Or are we gonna like uh, try to push something into an A-B testing to test it in an online and get feedback? Um, so that is kind of a midterm. And then our midterm is really like quarter. And then for the short term is kind of like a bi-weekly or a monthly is that we will just break it down into the weekly tasks. And the weekly tasks, like it's um, just more, I, I would say a straightforward to, to kind of uh, come up with because then it, you need to follow um, a routine set of tasks of crunching the data, feature engineering and feature transformation, assessing the quality of the data, um, and then building the first like model on it, train it, and then test it and see how it performs in an offline setting. And so these tasks are kind of the routine part of them, any like machine learning algorithm. So I think I think that's about it mostly. Um, so I, I mentioned the long-term, mid-term, and the short-term kind of uh, deliveries that we have. Yeah, no, no I, I really love that, like how detailed your answer was. And I think uh, based on my very small experience this summer at Amazon, like I was able to relate and also personally, like how I, I, I see the parallels between these two scenarios, as in like how we take projects in academia versus industry is much more similar. But of course, uh, industry is much more rigorous in terms of the uh, I think the aspects of projects are, like you said, like resources, how much engineering heavy these tasks would be. And I think those, those, and also the product centric, like it has to uh, fit into a particular product or into like a feature that it is going to roll out. So, but I, I do see parallels as in like how we see in academia, right? Like I think, um, uh, last year, my professor was write, writing a grant about something and she was constantly asking me questions like, is it possible to do this? Is it possible to do that? And I think she was putting the grant together and then grant was approved. And now I think that's what you call the phase two, right? Now the grant is approved. Now we have the data sets and we try out our basic machine learning models. We see what features we are just playing around with the data. So I think it, it's parallel for sure. Like uh, the grants are much more uh, loosely tied. Like we don't have that many uh, compulsions. We are we are much more, uh, we have that freedom or at least I would say lesser, lesser parameters on uh, the compulsions that we have. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I love your answer. I think it, it is much more um, uh, accurate. Okay. And um, uh, how like uh, and also like uh, I think uh, based on your profile, you have been working on recommendations research for a long time. Like even at Visa Research, even with your postdoctoral position, and I think even based like uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but also with your PhD dissertation, it was related on the basic concepts that relate to recommendation research. So I wanted to ask like how what was the first point that got you interested into AI research that you considered doing a PhD or pursuing this as a long career? And what was a specific time that you tapped into the recommendations research? What was something really unique about it that you wanted to pursue? Mm -hmm. um, 
so about the AI research, right? I um I did my masters um in um like I think in my masters that was the first time that I was exposed to data mining, right? And I was exposed to it in one of the courses and the intuitiveness of the data mining algorithms, how intuitive they are and how effective they are. Um, just um, it, it was very appealing and interesting to me. And I think that was the first time that I felt like, okay, I would like to actually work with such algorithms. And um, like um, from very early ages, like I really liked math and I was good at it. And um, I mean, um, applying data mining does not need that much, that much knowledge of a math, but understanding the algorithms and being able to uh, devise those algorithms and come up with new algorithms and stuff like that, right? That's something that uh, kept me in the field because I really like that. Um, and so I I did a master's uh, and I did master my master's in data mining and did, that was just my entry point to the world of data mining and machine learning. And then when I came to US for my PhD, I picked a very theoretical uh, domain of um, AI. And it was on um, matrix approximations in data streaming setting. And um, my, my PhD actually was not relevant to recommendations at all. It was completely like on um, just uh, looking at the uh, data streaming model where the data points are coming in a streaming fashion in a non-stop way. And you don't have any enough uh, computational resources and a space uh, or a storage, a storage resources to store the data. Or and be able to compute it, com do any computation on it later in a batch mode. So the the idea over there was that as the data points are coming in, we wanted to compute um, an approximation to these data points, right? And we were considering these data points in a matrix form, and that's why it is called the matrix approximations in a streaming format. And so we devised uh, an algorithm that was called the like, frequent directions that um, was able like to uh, provide a really good like error bound um, on these within the like short, uh, within the small space that um, the matrix sketching algorithm was using. And we showed that it outperformed like other algorithms like random projections or row and column sampling and CUR, like there are a lot of like methods in this field. We showed that the frequent directions outperform those um, uh, under the constraint that it has for a space. And so that, that was mostly my PhD, but then as I was working on that, I saw that the matrix sketching or matrix approximations or matrix factorizations is uh, a very underlying technique and method for recommendations, right? Um, many of the old recommendation techniques um, have a user item rating matrix that uh, they try to decompose it into two other matrices such that the product or multiplications of these two other matrices approximates the initial rating matrix, right? And um, once, once they do that, they will have a user embedding matrix and an item embedding matrix, and they can use these embedding matrices to compute the similarity or the relatedness between a user and an item, and then sort items based on those similarity score and recommend it to customers. So, um, and I think maybe that's how actually, like I also, uh, well, I also uh, was entered into the recommendation domain. Um, so that that's about it. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, I think in general, like recommendation has a lot of like applications and use cases. So it's really hard to miss it. Um, yeah. But also, like as I got uh, more involved with, with recommendations, I noticed all the uh, shortcomings that uh, matrix approximation techniques have for recommendations. Right? They are not scalable, so um, it's really hard, and also it's really hard like to use them in industrial settings uh, because of their uh, lack of scalability, and they underperform like every other like um, and more state of the art techniques like the neural nets, various neural nets techniques that we have. Um, so, um, so I think that's it. I stayed with recommendations, but the matrix sketching uh, is not uh, matrix sketching like is not being used in the recommendation domain. 
Right, right. And and just to follow up, as in like, I think I, I also got intrigued by the project that you mentioned about your PhD. So can you also uh, highlight like what would be a use case for that particular uh, algorithm? So you ma- you mentioned about data streaming. So you have lots of data coming in and you're trying to perform a matrix ap- approximation over there. So like what, what would be the use case, a typical scenario? Like where would such a system be highly useful for like can you give a real world scenario where um, mm-hmm. people could be using it of course not that method but like uh, along those uh, uh, those kind of methods mm-hmm. um so the streaming data model um, is a very common and widespread data model like all the interactions that we are having we're observing on the internet you can consider them as a streaming model every interaction that the customer has is one data point Right, mm-hmm. and uh, as the customers like interact with the websites um, in a very non-stop way, um, so we will. Uh, you can see that you have a stream of the interactions or a stream of data points. Right, so that's about it. That uh, that is a very common um, data pattern that we have, data modeling approach that we have, and the there are like many applications for that. Um, one applications for that is that, for example, you are having. Um, a lot of the customer interactions with your website and you want to detect like watch uh, you want to detect which interaction is an anomaly for example right so as you are receiving the customer's interactions you can compute uh, an approximation to the data points that you have received so far and for the uh, next like few data points you will just update this, uh, this approximation this approximation is going to capture the underlying subspace or the underlying manifold of the pattern of interactions with your website, right? So once you receive um, a new customer's interactions, you will compute how much uh, this interaction deviates from this underlying subspace. If this deviation is too much, then it could be an alarm. It could be very alarming that this interaction may be an anomaly in various ways, right? so this is one way. Uh, you, this is one way that people actually use uh, matrix approximations for anomaly detection, and they can use it in an online setting because you don't, you cannot store the whole data. You cannot do an offline computations or a batch computation on it, um, and you can uh, basically decide in real time whether this current interaction is um, anomaly or the safe interactions. Um, this is this is actually one of the good use cases that comes to my mind. Yeah, yeah, definitely interesting. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. And and also you did mention about scalability, and also in one of the other other um, answers that we first talked about was the idea of uh, getting these target labels, right? Like you explained how getting these target labels are like a difficult task for recommendations research. Mm-hmm. So. Can you overall, like, feel free to take as many points you have, like, but what are the most fundamentally unknown challenges in recommendations research? For example, like, I primarily work on medical AI problems, so I know lack of data sets is, like, a big problem because of confidentiality of data sets, right? Like, hospitals can't just share data for you to work on, and hence it is very hard for academia or industry to get these data sets and train their models. What are the, like, unknown fundamental research challenges that people struggle with or at least have uh, their algorithms tweaked so that they can get around are, the, are these challenges that uh, people work on on recommendations mm-hmm. research mm-hmm. yeah that's a that's a very important point in recommendations because uh, most of the companies in industrial use cases in general like we have like millions billions of items and millions of customers right so um, scalability is one of the main challenges in recommendation systems you want to be able to be uh, spontaneous and instantly in real time uh, provide a recommendation to customers that is relevant to them as customers behavior change every day or every hour as they are interacting with your website you want to be able to provide um a real time recommendations for them which is not repetitive also right uh, so so that is one thing and um then you have to scalability comes also in terms of the items you have to have a very high coverage of all the items that you have in your catalog right there shouldn't be an item that you your algorithm like freeze for it like your algorithm should be able to provide a recommendation for every item and um, one thing to mention here actually now that you're talking about uh, these items is that uh, recommendations inherently is a um, long tail distribution problem right when you look at the distributions of the items right they always follow a power law distributions in the sense that the, there are like a 
tiny fraction of items that are very popular and more frequently watched or requested or accessed by customers. And then there is a long tail of a lot of items that are, are niche items and few customers have interacted with them. Now providing uh, good recommendations for those head items or the popular items um, is kind of uh, easier, a lot easier a lot easier to build a recommendation and a lot easier to evaluate it because you have a lot of data on that. But as you go to the torso of the distribution or the tail of the distribution, the problem gets harder and harder because of lack of behavioral signal from customers, probably lack of like metadata on those items and so on and so forth. So you want to be able uh, to actually like, cover all the items that you have, right? That's one, that's one of the challenges. Then the other challenge is actually, which is re related to this, is the cold start problem that we have. Um, that is really hard to provide recommendations to cold start customers that haven't interacted with the website before. And so as a result, we have to have a fallback strategy for that, that we will fall back on the maybe uh, more popular items to recommend to, to that user, or should we like fall back to the average user's uh, behavior in that marketplace that the customer is? Um, so there are like various ways that we can go about it. Um, and then the problem exists for the cold start items too. Like for example, when you have a newly released TV show or a new released release movie that we don't have any rating on it and we don't have any votes on it. Uh, we have to rely on like a um, very uh, tiny subset of features for the video, like the genres, for example, or the cast or the director, right? To be able to infer that if we can use this in the recommendations to a customer. Um, besides these two, uh, I would say another issue that uh, shows up a lot is the diversity versus uh, relevancy of uh, recommendation result, right? As much as we want the recommendation uh, result to be relevant to customers, we don't want to uh, kind of get trapped into that uh, exploitation phase or exploitation stage, right? We want to be able to let the, to let the customer exploit as well as explore. So we want to, the set of recommendations to be diverse as well. Um, I think I think these are the three main challenges, I would say. Yeah, I, interesting. And I think like, yeah, as I'm listening to these, uh, these answers, it definitely feels like there are two types of uh, focuses. Like if you see uh, from an uh, industry standpoint, there are many challenges that go into building these systems that uh, like the engineering problems, right? Like as in uh, the product centric and also the resource centric uh, parameters that you are, are constantly trying to figure out once you have your algorithm and data feature engineering done. So is that like, um, so I think uh, like my, my other question is much more targeted towards like I think your position in also like you also maintain uh, an academic position at Stanford University. So I think you are wearing two different hats at the same time. So at one hat, you are also focusing on theoretical research and also fo focusing on improving recommendation systems. And on the other hand, there are these problems that have a real world uh uh, application where you are constantly trying to figure out like these parameters, like you said, like users want something versus um, this is not what we want and also engineering resources. So which one you find the most interesting one personally? Like what, like do you find uh, the theoretical pursuit of these particular algorithms? Like as in, I want to build a better algorithm that can take lesser data and produce better results. Or are you more inclined towards understanding, oh, hey, what are the challenging resources? I want a model that can be trained in, I don't know, like some lesser amount of time and takes amount less amount of data and all those things. Like which challenge do you personally prefer like the theoretical or the applied applied side of these projects um that's a very good question um i am mainly i can tell about my main interest first actually i am mainly interested in the theoretical aspect of things because i really like math and i just like to wrestle with those like equations and math and all um but then when you look at it like from the practical lens of view um I want to mention that uh, when we were actually, before the era of neural nets, right, when we were actually dealing with classical machine learning algorithms, um, 
data could only like serve us uh, to, to and so the data could only serve us like thus far. Like we, we could not improve the uh, performance of a classical ML algorithm by adding more and more data. But that doesn't hold anymore, right? That's not the case for neural net algorithm. We have seen like diffusion networks or we have seen all these like GPT-3 and the transformer based networks, right? The more data that you add to them, uh, the more the model is um, able to um, outperform all the other existing models, right? And I want to mention that as we know, like most of the neural nets, right, these days are, these days are over parameterized in the sense that the number of parameters mm -hmm. that they have is a lot more than the number of data that you are feeding into them. And as a result, so they are very powerful, right? Um, so we do not necessarily need um, like better algorithms or more efficient algorithms, right? Uh, because these neural nets have shown, and then we have a lot of like data, so we there is no shortage of data over there. But what what uh, I would say is really interesting to focus on and to work on is that um, how can we um, use a small uh, uh, how can we use a small sample of these like really powerful models to come up with the best ideal hyperparameters for them? and then like adapt it to the larger version of them, right? Um, and uh, I hope I'm not deviating too much from the question that you asked, but um, instead of, instead of uh, devising more efficient algorithms from scratch, I think we should have algorithms that uh, allow us to tune hyperparameters a lot better, right? Because in addition to parameters that uh, navigate and dictate the performance of an algorithm, hyperparameters also do that. And they have shown, we have shown in literature that they can change the performance of a model significantly. So one very active area nowadays is that like all these like uh, diffusion and transformer based models that have parameters in range of billions, right? It's really hard to tune their hyperparameters. So what researchers are working on these days is that they are trying to have a student model of it, a small version of it, uh, a small um, um, bit or a small version of those networks that they can have, they can um, figure out uh, optimal hyperparameters for them, for example, the optimal learning rate. And then they can show that, okay, so now with these new algorithms that we are proposing, you can figure out how would the optimal learning rate be for the target model, for the bigger model, right? So okay. I think I think if there is any place that we want to put our focus to devise new algorithms, it should be over there, that how we can have new algorithms to do a hyperparameter transfer from a small model to a larger model. Um, right. So... Yeah, but but what do you think? Like, I, I do agree with that. And this is like an open ended question is, uh, I, I do agree, like we can use these student models or smaller models of these versions to have the best set of para hyper parameters to tune the model. But using these models, wouldn't you think it would still uh, pose the issue of generalizability? Like, like you said, like we are using over parameterized models that are much more bigger than the sample data, like features in the in the sample space. But wouldn't you think like if 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 we if we use these models on a longer or much more permanent permanent basis, it would raise the questions of generalizability. Like in in the past, I think with ResNets and the standard uh, standard uh, CNN models. They have shown like if if you if you port up the data, it will fail a lot. Like it will fail drastically. Or if you give it like an OD OD um, uh, data sample space, like out of distribution, it will fail. So wouldn't you think like these large models won't be that much efficient when we use uh, like new, not generalized uh, sample space? Uh, and, and feel free to take like I, th I think that's an open-ended research question so i'm not expecting the solution to this like but what are your comments like these large models like like you said like large models uh are good but wouldn't you think these issues might prevail more using larger models um i i i don't have a very clean answer to that question uh but i feel like um so at least for many of these transformer models, they have shown that they perform really well, even on the tasks that are remotely uh, close to their uh, pre-training tasks, right? So uh, like, uh, and I think that that is a promising news. Uh, so in that case, I think like um, as the, as we are using like larger and larger set of data to train these models, the, we should expect from them to actually like perform on a larger uh, variety of tasks. That's what I think. Um, but um, yeah, 
I think that that's that's the comment that they have. I don't. I'm not sure about the how it would fail or why it would fail on the general generalized data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's completely fine. I mean, uh, yeah, this was something like I I I learned very recently about the idea of or like over parameterized uh prob like over parameterization problems in deep learning models. And I think one of the papers that I read was actually vision transformers. Like I, I forgot like what were the final uh, conclusions, but that was like more like an analysis paper that what happens, what is really happening, what like wh how how are the ablation studies happening of over over parameterization versus lesser parameterizations. But yeah, that was much more focused on the generalizability aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, uh, going back to your uh, other question is, uh, oh, sorry, my, my other question was, uh, you, like I have known literally like few people who maintain these two hats, like as, as I was saying, like academia and industry. And I think I also read your blog on Amazon where they have highlighted your um, interests, like how different, like being a professor at Stanford is helping you in research projects and also being in the, in, in the industry, like how it uh, influences different aspects into your project. Can you comment more on that? Like how do these two, like how, first of all, how do you manage these two, uh, these two different uh, domains of uh, teaching like i would say uh, teaching is much more different than working at uh, at a product centric company how do you manage these two positions and how how has that helped you in your research box exploring these projects mm -hmm. um so um i think at first i'm um, like from time aspect right it's not easy to manage it because like you have a full time job working at a company <laughs> and then now you have another like full time job like teaching a course um but um like since I uh, since I was actually in high school, I would say like I was, I had an interest for teaching. So when I was in high school, I was uh, teaching like math, and um, then in undergrad also I continued with it. And then when I came to US uh, in my PhD, I taught a seminar on matrix sketching. Um, after like few years of of the PhD, like in my third year of PhD, I think. Um, and then in my post, like I continued, and then now also like I taught the MMDS mining massive data set course in Stanford. Um, the the reason that I do that honestly is that like I I find it really like interesting and fruitful to have that interactions with the students. Um, you more often than not the students ask a question that um helps me to, helps me to actually like dive deeper into the topic for myself and then dig a little bit deeper like get the answers and then look at it like from their perspective look at it like that special use case that they have in mind and all um that is one thing and uh, like teaching in academia also allows me to carry that industrial experience that I have with me to the classroom right for example I where, where I, I had like multiple sessions on the MMDS course at Stanford that I was talking about the uh, Netflix prize challenge and all the recommendations algorithms that people are using nowadays so as I was talking as going as I was going through all the recommendations methods and algorithms I was like telling them that hey um in 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 practice, like these method suffers from like these issues. And in practice, like if uh, you don't have a lot of data and this is the first attempt that you're making and the recommendation in your company, definitely go with these algorithms because of so-and-so reasons, right? So carrying these experiences from industry to the classroom, um, it's very, uh, I would say joyful. And I feel like it's very re rewarding just even like for students as well. Um, so that is, um, that is very rewarding for me as well. So um, that's kind of a service that you provide to the community, right? Um, and um, what else? Uh, did I did I answer the question, or I think yeah. maybe I left the part unanswered? Yeah, no, you no, you definitely did. I think like that was the idea. Like where you fo like uh, uh, talk more about like the idea of uh, how teaching definitely helps you and motivates you right so as in yeah mm -hmm. I, I do agree like yeah uh, at some point like I'm, I I think I would be a very bad as a professor but definitely I do see the value of someone doing that because um, even when I moved to US my my respect for professors and people who are in the teaching community like like it it rise very high because I think people are like uh Apart from doing all these projects, writing grants and everything, they're teaching courses and they're teaching these courses over the years. Like they know in and out of all these subjects, like they are teaching the same course, same material for like so many years. And they have some great insights. Uh, they keep on they keep on furnishing these things. So, yeah, I mean, it definitely makes sense. If I had the courage to do that, I'll definitely do that one day. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. 
Oh, yeah, no worries. I, I find it that uh, teaching um, and presenting in general, even if you're not in a classroom and you're presenting a topic, right, to customers, um, it helps me a lot to um, have a more effective communications. Like I feel like I have improved a lot in my communications, especially when I'm trying to explain a CS concept to a non-CS audience. Yeah. Um, teaching actually like uh, kind of forces you to use your creativity and simplify the notions without it losing its essence, right? So, so you want you want to convey what this algorithm is doing exactly and simplify it, but without simplifying it too much. And that skill uh, improves the communication. And then when you come back to industry and you are uh, working with non-researchers, non-scientists, uh, some engineers or some pro product managers or project managers that you need to communicate with them, then that skill comes really handy because mm -hmm. then you can explain it to them. And so, yeah, that's one of the main benefits. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, I can just second to that particular thing is like a very embarrassing thing that I did, like when I joined uh, PhD, I think this was like a couple of months and, and I was working on a very simplistic uh, problem. So we have clinical data sets, it's just like a two dimensional data. And I was supposed to try out different classification algorithms to see if any kind of uh, patterns we can find in the data sets for disease versus healthy patients. And I did that. And as a standard, like we have small, small data sets. So we try out leave one out cross validation or file like K4 cross validation right and um I was presenting this to like neurologists from Mayo Clinic. And so they don't, don't know much about like what classification algorithms mean and everything. And then I was like, they asked me like, what do you exactly mean by leave one out cross validation? What's really happening? We have seen cross validation, but we don't know what leave one out. And I was trying to explain. And then at that moment when I, I was presenting, I, I realized, oh, I made a mistake in my code. This was not something I was uh, supposed to do. Because, and that was a time like I, I was in the middle of the presentation. I realized, hey, I did not figure that thing out. And then I think uh, I, I I went back and I updated those uh, slides, sent them over email. So yeah, I, I agree, like how presenting can really help. And especially from people who are not from the computer mm -hmm. science domain, it helps you also verify, do we need this in the first place? Because they can help you understand, okay, this is not something we need. So yeah, uh, I, I, I love that idea. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And, and also, yeah, uh, going also back to the idea of like how you said you learned the idea of teaching. So feel free to take this uh, answer anywhere. But if... I know the idea of uh, computer science research is very lucrative. Like people find it very interesting when we see a researcher working in a big tech company like Amazon, Google, and everything. But do you think in current in current times, do you think a PhD is necessary? Should one get a PhD if they want to do a job in research in big tech companies? And reflecting back, like now I think you have been like you have been a student, you have been you you, you did your postdoctoral, you also are now a professor and also at the industry. Do you do you reflect back saying like should you don't have a PhD or not uh, if you were to apply for the same position? Mm, okay, I would say that um, it depends on their interest or if they are genuinely interested in focusing on a subdomain of a field. Because that's, that, will, that is what happens if you start a PhD and that's what happens if you are going to work as a researcher. The whole CS as a field is too huge or the whole machine learning, like not even, let's not even talk about CS, but CS is a major. The machine learning as a field is so huge that once you start your PhD and you become a researcher, you can only like focus on um, probably one subdomain of machine learning, right? So if they are interested in that to to stay in one subdomain and then like uh, pushing the boundaries of that subdomain contributing to the field by doing original research and all then yes they should definitely start a phd because that is what phd is going to help them it's going to give them a mathematical maturity it's going to give them a um, reasoning maturity that they can kind of um uh assess the quality and the, they can really like assess the quality and analyze the algorithms and methods right so that uh, maturity that skill set that phd brings to them by focusing so much uh, on the research on the literature for like five years that is a very valuable asset to have and if they want to continue their career as a researcher irrespective of the title that companies are, are going to give them, right? They can be a research scientist and just uh, work mostly on productionizing uh, prototypes, right? But if they want to like push the boundaries of the research in that subdomain that they have studied, then they should definitely do, the P do a PhD because that will just prepare them for what is going to come next for them. 
but uh, it is possible and it is a very like doable thing that not to do a PhD and you can be a really good machine learning engineer or you can be a really good applied scientist that is not doing original research, but it is like applying the machine learning algorithms on uh, various use cases and various data sets that uh, companies have. And that is still like very worthy and valuable, but I'm just saying that there is a distinction between um, pushing uh, existing algorithms and models into production versus pushing the boundaries of the research and like doing original research. So, right. yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting, and I think like um, yeah, these are better words. I think like I I do understand what you are trying to say, but as in like you put it much more better in terms of words. So yeah, thanks for doing that. And I think just to add on to that is uh, like would would you like uh, let me uh, ask also a follow up question is would you would you characterize any kind of skills that you learned while you're doing your PhD that are not very like not very commonly talked about? I think one of the other like skills that I personally can think is the idea of uh, uh, figuring out the other the subtle characteristics of a project so as in when when i was when i'm working on these uh, data sets like i'm working with alzheimer's disease a lot and i think like the idea like when i started uh, my phd i was always on the point that okay 80% of that would be like uh, focused on coding programming training the best models in the best way so that like it's doing parallel processing and everything like just being a very computer science nerdy person i thought that would be like major focus of my research but into uh, 6 months into my phd i realized that was like the least concern my professor was least concerned if i like wrote the best code like best readable code with comments and everything but i think much more focus was on understanding the research problem the domain of research be it even if it out of out of computer science so understanding what like and i also talk to clinicians physicians people who are under, understand the biomed like who also understand engineering aspects of these problems and all these so i think there are a lot of and even even for recommendation research i, I think that would be like a lot of domain knowledge that you need to understand in order to deliver these things so can you comment on like what were the skills that you learned uh, during your phd that people don't talk about there's no technical guidebook that say oh these are the seven chapters you will learn while doing your phd but you still learned and they are still applicable uh, at your current role at Amazon, do you have any comments? And it's fine. Like, uh, feel free to take it as much uh, deeper or more points you want. Mm -hmm. um, so, as as you were talking about your own experience, right, with your advisor and the uh, uh, like, first six months of your PhD, I was thinking about it. That probably the biggest thing that my PhD gave to me is that um, having that mindset of the long term thinking, and that starts with problem formulation and then doing a literature review, picking the best model, finding the gap in the uh, literature. Um, like right now in Amazon, like um, we were, in my team, we were mostly focused on productionizing for the video entities, right? So we were not necessarily wanting to have a very novel uh, algorithmic model, right? We wanted to have a modeling approach that works for our data with the uh, kind of constraint and limitations that our data has, right? Um, so just um, having that into the consideration, I wanted to say that when in Amazon, we write a roadmap for the science team, right? For the recommendation system, for the next like few quarters or the next one year. That mindset that allows us to, to write a scientific roadmap comes from my PhD. That is what I think my PhD gave me because that allowed me to look at the data, look at our constraint, look at our resources, using those, formulate the problem, like define the problem and not jump into the solution. That would be step one, and then do a literature review to see that what are the feasible methods out there that are gonna be uh, practical in my use case. And then look at the pros and cons of them and then see if we can tweak any of those that so that they actually like fit our scenario better. and. Um, then from there, like we would just like shrink it uh, because we have to, we have a lot of the latency, latency constraint, uh, scalability constraint, like, right, all the resources constraint. So then we have to like break it down into like multiple like phases. That's for example, okay, if you are working on the recommendation, how about in phase one, you provide a relevant recommendation just for head items. And then in phase two, you provide the good recommendations for head and torso, for example. And then eventually you want to have a full coverage on all the items in catalog to cover the tail items as well. So all these like roadmap that step-by-step -step goes from problem formulations to the literature review, to looking at the gap, picking the one that is gonna be fit your scenario, go with the break it, 
down into breakage into the phases and all that came from my phd i feel that mindset of analyzing um have that uh, sense that you can distinguish what is going to work and what is not going to work but yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i love that yeah i'm yeah i don't have anything to add but i i also I, like i also want to tweak more on as in like can you comment more on the uh, decision process so what was the what was the factors that you consider while you were opting for a phd as in like why didn't you just go for a job while after doing your masters and also the same question that you uh, that applies to after phd what was the factors that you consider that you uh, chose for an applied scientist job uh, at sorry research scientist job at visa research rather than doing like a full uh, academia position after your postdoc so and okay. i think you were i think you were the closest person to becoming an assistant professor right like you did your postdocs i think anyone would be expecting uh, you to be like uh, 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 in the academia so what were the factors before phd and after phd for you um yeah yeah that is right uh, even um, so i did a postdoc because i was not sure if i want to stay in academia or i want to join industry um but then after being in postdoc, I felt like I have had like about like six, seven years of experience in academia and not that much experience in a research lab in industry. And so I wanted to start with some research groups in industry. I know that there are like really good people out there in the research labs that I knew like some of them. And uh, in my PhD, actually, I had uh, I had had collaborations with few of them. So I wanted to join a research lab so that I can um work uh, on those like um, on real real use cases i can work on the algorithm not just from the theoretical side which is what i had focused on in my phd but also like from a practical side also like what are the other constraints that would come and then also uh, i knew that if i join a research lab if i join the industries then i have to be more hands-on on the coding on the implementation and probably on productionizing thing which is what i got here in amazon um, and at the time, like I thought that's going to be a really valuable skill for me to add to my kind of skill sets. Um, so that's that's the reason. I see. Um. I see. Interesting. And let me ask you uh, one other question that I personally challenge a lot myself with is, um, do you like I think you started your PhD during I think deep learning was on curve, like it was I think in a very rising phase, people were exploring publishing a lot of stuff. But nowadays, I think like, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, that this could be just my interpretation, I started in 2020. And I already feel saturated, like I can I, I, I think I post less on Instagram rather than people posting their papers on archive. Like I find the consistent, it's hard to cope up with papers. And even then, I think my field is still a very niche, like medical plus AI. So it's it's limited by data sets and I think collaborators and everything. What is your perspective on that? Like you started off when I think people like, I, it could be like it could be crazy even back then, but it's, it's definitely crazy. First of all, do you agree to that? Like, do you feel um, the research in deep learning community overall is very fast and robust compared to other inter interdisciplinary sciences and secondly how do you cope up with it if that's the case you don't you don't cope <laughs> up with it um so i think that I, I hope that answers the first question that yes <laughs> it can be really overwhelming and it can get really intimidating as well which is why you we need to have that uh, sense that helps us to distinguish poor work from a high quality work there are like way too many works getting published and there are like too many conferences right and uh, we should not uh, like just get intimidated by the quantity of the works that are getting published. So the nature of science always in the history has been that it is incremental, right? There are like very few works that come in like out of blue that are making a very like pivotal change completely, like changing the whole directions of the science. More, more often than not, it is a very incremental steps, right? And that increment nature uh, calls for a uh, high quantity of work, right? Because every work is adding like a tiny baby step to the science field. Um, so I think we shouldn't get intimidated uh, just because we have to acknowledge that the whole um, the whole nature of science getting uh, evolved is incremental. So then that calls for a lot of papers coming out. But uh, one other way that helps me not to get like overwhelmed by too many work is that um, at least in the field that I work in, right, I have read way too many papers and listened to so many talks and all that now I can uh, tell, uh, I can tell apart a good work from a mediocre work, right? Yeah. And I do not need to spend that much time on a paper. I can just uh, skim the paper and then figure out if this paper has anything to tell or no, right? 
and uh, also like you would know people who do high quality work and you can just follow those people's work um mm. that that is another way to go about it um but in general keeping up with the whole like deep learning world is impossible like we have to focus on the area of deep learning that is that is our area that is the area that we are working on right yeah uh, there's too much distractions there is not good also like you don't want to get distracted by too many work and not being able to contribute to yourself yeah and yeah and, and i think the last thing that you said like resonates with me a lot i think uh, only a month back i was uh, like focused like after my in- internship i think i was focused on uh, like there was a uh, like a meeting with my professor where i was j- jotting down my ideas like okay where do i want to contribute in my phd dissertation right like where we discuss okay what are the problems i want to work on and i think there were a few papers that she said like present to me what your thoughts are and then we'll have a discussion and i think when i showed them the papers like i think the first thing she did was like scroll down to the bottom of the results section and also like let me show you what the paper uh, tries to do and everything but i think those people can understand like they can just judge the paper based on their results so like like you said like it's very easy to judge good good research versus bad research once you start reading a lot of papers and then you understand like exactly is this like a very uh, very small incremental versus like a very robust idea that the authors have proposed so i think yeah i i think i'm still yet to build that particular uh, expertise i'm i'm still on the way but i i like that and i resonate with that like as in um, uh, figuring out and filtering out the papers that are actually meaningful versus who have done just some uh, experimental work so yeah mm-hmm. I I just want to quote uh, one thing from my supervisor when I was uh, in my postdoc in Rutgers. My supervisor actually like told me that um his whole PhD thesis came from one paper that he read in his PhD and even that paper he didn't read past section 5. So just <laughs> he read the first like section 5. And he said that that is how it, how uh, our attitude and our mindset should be uh, with respect to the papers. Papers are not like uh, you know books that you just a story books that you just get and read it like end to end right you read the paper uh like in a short like portions and then try to think really deeply about it and um that that was his point and his point was that like from any two paper probably in if you think on them deeply and you force yourself to combine the ideas um you will get creative and you will come up with your own ideas or you will uh, come up with a really good, uh, a strong analysis of the two papers that, hey, this is the pros and cons of these papers. If you combine them, this will happen, that will happen. So his whole point was that don't try to, um, don't try to kind of make your brain a space that's too crowded by reading too much. Like rather mm-hmm. read very few and then think deeply on them and try to like uh, analyze them. So I think that that actually helps me a lot as well like when i pick papers so and 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 one uh, branch of question i have like because you said uh, on these particular things like your supervisor's dissertation so looking back like would you have any advice for people uh, for focusing on the uh, dissertation as in what makes really a good dissertation versus like a bad dissertation uh, like I, i think there are at least in deep learning there are lots of problems where they focus on applied research right like it it might not be a theoretical contribution but it would be just like tweaking the training strategy or like just very minor tweaks to a particularly well accepted architecture looking back and now you are analyzing other people's works also like what makes a good dissertation what really counts that hey this person has done really great work in phd versus mm, i'm not sure like how how do you go from there mm, i would say that uh, they should start with a good literature review first so that that helps them to identify a good gap okay mm. and then try to attack the gap right so a good dissertation comes from a good uh, problem right and one uh, as long as they have not identified a good gap that exists um, like any other problem that they just start solving it just because it's a low hanging fruit or just because they know how to solve it i mean that would not um, kind of uh, push the field into any directions so um yeah. i think a good re- PhD research or a good PhD dissertation starts with a good uh, problem identification. Um, I would I would say that um, mm. they they should not settle for any other like smaller problems just because it is easier to solve. Right? If they really care about the quality of the work that they are gonna present to the world, 
they're going to offer to the world, they should start by under identifying the really like existing gaps that um, like people are stuck with. And they have five years to think about it. So hopefully they will come <laughs> yeah. up with something. Yeah. 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 No, I love that. I think, uh, yeah, you and I'll, I'm going to use that particular insight personally. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, one last question that I have, like that is like the proper zoom out of version of this is, uh, I think you you do interact with a lot of students being a professor uh, at Stanford, and I think you would have better insight. So this particular question is, uh, the big I think the cold start problem for students uh, in deep learning pro in deep learning space is like a big uh, big question, right? So it's very easy to get interested into deep learning, but it's equally hard to maintain your interest and actually pursue a long career in deep learning. People get interested, they try out, and then they they, they get burnt out, or maybe the mathematics is too much to uh, cope up with or understand. So if, if there's a person who is newly interested into deep learning, and then, again, I also want to talk about like there are tons of domains, right? Like recommendations, imaging, language processing, reinforcement learning, robotics, and lots of things, and equal all of them are equally interesting. How does one navigate their interest? What is the like? What is the thing that interests them? Like, is it medical imaging, computer vision, language uh, recommendations? How do I navigate when I find my interest that hey, AI is good? How do I navigate from there uh, to like building a career in uh, deep learning? So, is the question on once they have found their interest, how do they navigate it from their like I guess education into a career? Yeah, let's just assume like the, the the initial part that we talked about, like as in how you, uh, Alexa is using recommendations research to provide you the best uh, videos or any kind of content. I find that interesting and I, I want to be a part of that. I learned, okay, these recommendations systems are like model A, model B, model C. I find it very interesting. But how do I go from like, how do I start? How do I understand the basics to maybe hopefully landing a, a similar position where you are, like you are a researcher who can take these tasks independently. So how do I go from zero to uh, some some stage mm -hmm. so okay first um first i think we have to acknowledge that all these like subdomains of machine learning they are very interconnected right whether you are working on nlp or computer regions or like you are working on transformers or any other like recommendations or ranking right the they are very interconnected. The basics and fundamentals of machine learning does not change, right? The, the kind of the uh, frameworks that people use for coding, the um, classical like machine learning, like strategies for training, testing, validation, evaluations, they do not change. They are the same. What changes from one subdomain to another subdomain is a set of techniques, underlying techniques, right? To get to know those set of techniques does not take that long, right? In a year or less than a year, you will be able to like catch up with the state of the art techniques in any of the domain if you want to change, right? So I myself, I changed my domain completely from the theoretical matrix approximations into recommendations. And then like uh, in the last, like I would say six or nine months, I changed to ranking, right? So um, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, we shouldn't be like, um, we shouldn't be worried about like what domain we are working in and then what domain we are going to get interested in. In fact, it's better that if we uh, try to have a strong foundations in our learning, in our educations, and that foundation is going to serve us uh, when as we are actually like moving from one subdomain to another subdomain. Um, that is one. And then um, it's also, I feel like it's actually a really good practice as well that you try to expand your uh, knowledge set uh, by bringing another like subdomain into your own interest. Um, hmm. And how how does that happen? Um, I'm not sure exactly how that happens because I never tried to get interested into a subdomain. Um, I um, When I was working on matrix sketching, uh, neural nets was very hype. And I was not working on that because I uh, I was really like enjoying my time with the, with the matrices and linear algebra and over there. Uh, but now I'm working with the neural nets. So I think the um, probably the literature the the community of researchers and scientists that you are working with probably they will like shift your dynamic right shift your interest as well um so i i don't have any uh, i don't know how we can actually like change our domain but i feel like we just need to have a strong foundations of mathematics statistics uh knowing knowing the basics of machine learning um yeah that's it 
Yeah. No, I uh, now that you say like I I think it reflects me even better is uh like like what you said like I think the initial part of learning the fundamentals be it any domain like even language processing vision or recommendation the initial part of getting started is very common I think I would say more than uh, 70% of the path and I relate that because uh, when I joined my PhD I think I replaced a person like who graduated just before I gra- uh, I started my PhD so many of the projects I was just taking uh, from him and his whole dissertation was again on uh, interpret AI models specific to medical imaging and I thought hey uh, I'll just see where he goes like where does he go to work and the first job he takes up was in LinkedIn so I asked him like w- w- like wouldn't it be completely like let alone even medical imaging he's not even working on imaging data sets so that's when I think and I was thinking in the idea of like what do, what do research and PhD would align me and help me in my industry that's when I learned I think it's very easy to like jump from one domain to the other. I won't, I won't say easy, but it's fairly easy for a researcher who has been in the field from one one uh, in a particular task. They can switch if they have the literature review. And I think I think he now works at cruise.ai, like, which is like a self-driving domain, which is like, again, completely different, like not even related to medical imaging. But it's, it's easy to even task, like jump these tasks once you know what goes into research, right? Like you know how to do a literature survey, understand the problems, implement things, do your uh, state of the art analysis. And then when it comes to, I think, deploying models, like I think it's it's like there's a common language that speaks across implementing all these models. So I'm not sure. Like I, th- I think it, it somewhere aligns to what you said. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. I just wanted to add that many of the strong computer scientists that I know, they have uh, their background in either mathematics or statistics, applied statistics, right? So that speaks yeah. a lot to the strong foundations that we can have. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's and great. and uh, and like, would you would you like to highlight any kind of big mistakes that you see any kind of young researchers or students like me make when they get started in machine learning? Like, like we would definitely say, hey guys, don't do this if you if you uh, if you are genuinely interested. Do you see any kind of mistakes that people do? Um, I'm not sure if like they do, but do you have any comments on that? I I haven't been. I'm not in touch with the PhD students who are like working on their research. But then uh, when I was in my PhDs and um, I was in the community of PhD students, I think one common mistake that all of us had was that we were trying to focus so much on hitting the required number of papers for having a PhD or graduate, right? And I wouldn't yeah. call this necessarily uh, the students' mistakes. It is the whole mistakes of the whole ecosystem that you need to have yeah. like, I don't know, five, six, four, seven papers to graduate because that would sacrifice the quantity for quality of the work that you can do. You, yeah. yeah, it's it's more worthy to graduate with one paper that has filled in one gap, one huge gap in the in the uh, literature, right? Um, yeah, I I would say only that one. That is something that caught my eye when I was doing my PhD. Um, yeah, that is that was on, and then also like it's expected from most students to like complete at least four years. And then on average, yeah. five years to graduate. In my first year of PhD, I had enough papers that I could just graduate. And that was just three years. But they were like, this is too early to graduate. And I feel like <laughs> there was no reason for me to stay it one and a half year. Um, so these things that are kind of uh, defined for some reason yeah. by the whole ecosystem, I think those these are like mistakes. Science yeah. should be free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? yeah hopefully free I think. Theory of a structure. Just want to say theory of a structure. Yeah. 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 Hopefully, I think yeah, this this thing that does get removed. I think yeah, there's a there's a understanding. Like even even I think when when I, when I uh, talk back to my parents, they so like I did my masters at ASU, right? So I think in terms of like I think the, I don't know if you're still aware. Like there's a whole credit thing. Like we have to complete certain credits in order to graduate, and they they have this basic assumption that okay, PhD takes around five to six years, and I was like, no, I I can do it sooner if I if I do significant work. But I think that's the very um um notion that or stereotype i think that if you are into psd mm-hmm. once you start it takes you around five to six uh wow. years so yeah hopefully hopefully i think it, it must makes much more subjective evaluation rather than objective like like you said like number of years or number of papers is not something people keep on evaluating yeah um but to add to my answer one thing as i am actually like getting more mature in, in like the research as a researcher one thing that i have changed in my style of working is that i try to reflect more on the papers that i read 
rather than just read the paper, um, then discussing it, brainstorming, I try to reflect on it. I try to think about it, like try to extract the points of it, right? Um, how would I have done it differently? And then another thing that in Amazon actually like taught me or forced me to do this was that try to think how I can apply this on our use case in Amazon, on our data. So these kind of things that I actually put it under the umbrella of reflection on the paper helps a lot to um, kind of let the material like sink in uh, with you and then get a better intuitive understanding on it, of it, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. I, I, I love these insights for sure. Um, but yeah, with that, I think that was the last question I had. I think, yeah, we are we are close to the time that we have. So I'll, I'd like to thank you once again. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, being on the podcast. I think we covered a lot of things from your background to roles uh, at Amazon, at least specific or applied scientists, research scientists, and also much more on recommendation systems and also more about research, doing a PhD and other uh, latent aspects of doing research. So yeah, thanks. Uh, hopefully, and, and who's ever listening to this particular podcast finds this useful i'll be leaving a link to your i think blog articles and also your linkedin so that if someone is genuinely interested in your work they can reach out to you so um yeah and hope to keep in contact with you so yeah yeah for sure thanks so much jay for your time it was really nice talking to you